to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by United Poultry Concerns. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find our past shows and my contact information if you'd like to get in touch with me at our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org. Today we are continuing the Micro Sanctuary series where I am featuring a different small sanctuary each month throughout the summer, and today is our third installment of the series about micro sanctuaries or small scale sanctuaries, and we have something today that's different and new and exciting, and that is fish rescue. I had a conversation with Gwendolyn Church, who has started rescuing fishes and has transformed her home into a fish sanctuary. And if you love animal rescue stories, you're going to love this interview. There are such sweet stories of these fishes. Gwendolyn has an obvious love and affection for these individuals, and the stories are so endearing. She was very knowledgeable about the industry, and and I do want to mention, we talked about it briefly in the episode, but I encourage you to watch the film that is out now called The Dark Hobby about the saltwater tropical fish trade and the detrimental environmental impacts, as well as, of course, the horrible, uh, how horrible it is for the individual fishes. I'll have a link to that in the show notes, the movie The Dark Hobby, for more information on this subject. So we're going to just jump right into this awesome interview. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, so today we are joined by Gwendolyn Church, and she is the founder of Friends of Philip Fish Rescue, an aquatic animal sanctuary and rescue in Sonoma County, California. Friends of Philip aims to expand the animal rescue conversation to include fish and aquatic animals and to foster the connection between people and aquatic life through sharing the stories and vibrant personalities of their rescued animals. The organization provides sanctuary and rescue for animals in need and advocates for ending the consumption and commodification of fish and other aquatic species. So I'm really happy to have Gwendolyn here with us today. Welcome, Gwendolyn. Hi, Hope. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. And I'm so amazed at the new surge of interest in fish and and especially fish rescue. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. So I want to start with you. Why don't you tell us a little about you? I believe that all animal advocates are superheroes and all superheroes have origin stories. So when did you go vegan? Why did you go vegan? What's, what's your personal story? How did you get into all this? So I went vegan um, back in 2016. So I'm I'm relatively new to the scene compared to a lot of people, but I have kind of a, a vegan journey, if you will, that I think is incredibly similar to most people. I I grew up with animals. We always had many pets in our household and things like that. And I identified very, very strongly through my life and still now as an animal lover. So my relationships with animals in my life were always very, very important to me. And then in early 2016, I came across these videos about meat production and was just kind of floored. I I had never seen that before. And so it was very shocking to realize that the things that I was supporting in the way that I was living, even though I wasn't specifically aware of that, that that was very, very at odds with this view that I had of myself as an animal lover and someone who cares so strongly about animals. So I went vegetarian in the beginning of 2016. And then about six months later, I had learned more about eggs and dairy. And and that was kind of the thing that that made me go vegan. And then with with that long-term kind of love of animals through my life, um, getting into working with animals was kind of the natural progression. You know, I I think I had the experience that a lot of people do where you go vegan and suddenly you're aware of this just huge, horrible problem. And I felt very angry and I was very sad and I really struggled to deal with this just immense, very real kind of sorrow. 
at what was happening and what's still happening to animals. And I realized after about a year of being a vegan that the only way that I was going to be able to cope with that really was if I started to do something to, to help to be part of the solution. And so that was what got me volunteering at a, a local farm animal sanctuary um, called Goatlandia. And I, I go there, I still go there once a week and I help kind of feed the animals and spend time with them and, and make sure that their enclosures are clean and just that, you know, we try to give them the best life they can have. And that was the thing that helped me feel more like, you know, I was, I was being part of the solution. So from there, I, I had that thought that I think every vegan has and that I still kind of have where I was thinking like, wow, wouldn't it be really cool if I started a farm animal sanctuary? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think everybody who has that deep connection with animals has that thought at some point. And the reality for most of us, of course, is that our, our living situations or our life situations or any of those things maybe aren't super conducive to starting a full-scale farm animal sanctuary. But I, I came across a comment on a, a website called Reddit. It's like a big community website. And I came across a, a story someone shared of their experience rescuing a betta from a um, large chain pet store that they found a sick fish and they asked the manager if they could take the fish um, home as an adoption to try to help them recover. But I, I came across that, that story and I thought like, wow, that's, that's something that I could do. Like maybe I can't have a farm animal sanctuary, but I could certainly have a fish tank and I could rescue a fish. And I was thinking, oh, like a single fish. That seemed very exciting. And, and I was really into, and still I'm very into plants and gardening. And so I thought I'll get an aquarium I'll fill it with aquatic plants. I'll make it like this nice, beautiful display that I can have with my other house plants. And then if I ever come across a betta in need, I have this home that could be ready and could be nice for this little fish to live in and have a happy life. And, you know, of course, the, the whole best laid plans off go awry kind of thing. I was at PetSmart, one of those big chain stores, um, just looking at aquariums to see what I was signing up for, how much money I was going to spend. And I stopped to look at the betta fish display. And I'm sure you've seen these. I think most people have. The way that bettas are sold in most pet stores is really remarkable and very heartbreaking. They're there in these individual cups because they're very aggressive fish who can't be kept together. So they're there sold in these individual cups that are about the size of like what we would drink as a glass of water. And they're on these racks and they're there for sale. And it's just so sad. And so I stopped to look at them and most of them really looked okay. But then in the back, there was this one little fish who his fins were rotted away. He was super pale. He was clearly sick and underweight and very unhealthy. And even to me at the time who really knew relatively little about fish and like what a healthy fish looks like, it was so incredibly apparent that this fish was going to die. So despite not having my aquarium or anything set up just yet, I took him off the shelf and asked the manager if they would let me take him as an adoption to try to help him recover. And the manager said yes. And so then I was able to leave with this fish and take him home. And I ran out to another pet store and, and got a tank and set all that up and moved him in and then spent like the next week and a half in this just state of anxiety to try to, you know, hope that I wasn't going to, in my kind of naivety, hurt this little fish or anything like that. And he recovered and he didn't just recover. He really began to thrive. His, his fins grew back in, his color went from pale and sickly to just vibrant and amazing. And um, within about a month or two months, his fins were completely grown back and he was just unrecognizable. He was active and curious and coming to the glass to greet me and all of these things. And of course, that little fish is Philip, and he still lives in that 10 gallon tank that I originally set up, and he's still doing well. And he still comes out to say hello and, and ask for food and do his little wiggle dance at the front of the tank. That was kind of like the, the moment of like, wow, this is something that I could do. Like, I don't have acres for a farm animal sanctuary, but I have some table space and I could set up a couple <laughs> more aquariums and bring a few more fish home. So, so that's what I did. And I set up more tanks and, and had my little rescue fish here living with me. And that, that was kind of what got me into fish specifically. It was almost an accidental thing in some ways. And you say, of course, that's Philip because the name of your rescue is Friends of Philip Fish Rescue. So he was your yes, first. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So you started with Philip, and now I know you've expanded and you have several tanks. Uh, so what was that journey like, and uh, and and how did the fish come to you? And so you you never pay for a fish, right? You rescue Correct. them. Yes. So how how does all that work? So yeah, I, I do have quite a few tanks now, and um, the fish that come in come either as owner surrenders or what I call like a store rescue, where a store rescue is exactly what I did with Philip. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am at the store. You can imagine I go to quite a few pet stores to buy fish equipment and things like that. And every time I'm at a store, I stop and I look at the fish and I look at the bettas and I look at the aquariums and all of those things. And when I see a fish who is sick or unhealthy, I raise that with the manager and, you know, I'm, I'm just polite about it. And I, I know they have a zillion animals to take care of and that it, it can be a challenging juggling act in a lot of ways, but I point out a fish that maybe is, is looking like he's suffering. And I ask if either I can give them the fish to treat or if they'll let me take the fish home as an adoption. And so I have, most of my bettas have come that way as, as store rescues. And then for the owner surrenders, it's people who maybe are moving, who just aren't interested in keeping an aquarium anymore, things like that, who, who will basically give me their fish as opposed to maybe taking them back to the store. I had one person tell me that they were planning to flush their fish down the toilet instead, oh. and then they found the rescue, you know, so it's a yeah. whole bunch of different situations that these fish really come from. I can't believe people would still do that. I, you know, you hear, you heard about that long ago, but I guess ugh, people would still uh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's really awful. Yeah. And it's so heartbreaking. So I just want to say that I love following you on Facebook. Oh, thank uh, you. Yeah. Friends of Philip Fish Rescue on Facebook. I really encourage anyone who's on Facebook to like them and, and check out their page because it's just so fun to hear all of the fish's stories. You have such wonderful uh, documentation of, of all their stories and the dramas and the triumphs and the recoveries. <laughs> it's, um, it's a lot of fun and it's so educational. Educational. So, you know, thank you for telling their stories on Facebook. It's, it's really great. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, and it's so fun to witness those stories. It feels like such a privilege to bring a fish in and facilitate some of these, just, it feels almost like a miraculous recovery for some of these fish to see the changes they go through. And it's, it's really incredible to witness and facilitate that. Yeah. I've seen some of your before and after pictures and that's the before pictures, the fish just kind of look really on, on death's door. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the after pictures, they're all bright and beautiful and vibrant colors. And it's just really, really beautiful to see. Yes. It's, it's really incredible. So many people still believe numerous myths about fish, like that they don't feel pain and that they're simple or unintelligent. And, you know, we've learned so much about fish in the last couple of decades, the research and science around fish cognition and their complex emotions, and that they certainly feel pain just as we do, just as other mammals and avians do. We're learning all that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious what you've learned from your rescue work and from interacting with these fish and living with these fish. Can you help us dispel some of these myths? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's remarkable coming from the perspective of someone who lives with so many fish to know that these myths are still so widespread mm. because speaking purely anecdotally, I, I watch these fish and I see the way that they interact with each other and the way that they experience the world and the way that they can learn and that they can be taught and their relationships with each other and their relationships to me. And from that perspective, it's so abundantly clear that these are conscious feeling animals. It can be overwhelming sometimes to remember how dismissed they are and how many of those myths really are perpetuated. So I think it's great that we get to talk about that. One thing that I, I really want to emphasize when we're talking about fish, it's really important to remember that it's not like we're talking about cows or dogs where you have the the species and then you have these different breeds and different varieties and things when we talk about fish as a general group that's referring to over 33,000 different species and 
when we're looking at numbers of fish, that number of species is more than the combined total of all known vertebrates on earth. The group fish includes about 60% of all of the known species on earth with backbones. When we look at it from that perspective, that these myths are so widespread that fish don't feel pain or that they're simple or unintelligent, the sheer scale of that assumption is kind of staggering, Mm. really, to to assume that 60% of all known vertebrate species don't feel pain or don't don't have experiences or that they're unintelligent. Um, So I I really try to keep that perspective in mind. And also then it, it makes a lot of sense then that looking at this number of species that we are still learning so much about the individual experiences of these animals. So when we're talking about fish, I like to keep that in mind, but there are things that we know broadly about fish as well. And of course, like you said, a huge one is that we do know that fish feel pain. It's not a question of belief or any of that. It's a scientific consensus that fish feel pain. Yeah. Um, and there are quite a few groups that really support the, the weight of evidence for fish pain. And, and one of those is the American Veterinary Medical Association. And that association in 2013, they released their, well, they, they released their 2013 guidelines for euthanasia of animals. And they stated that the evidence of cognition and sentience in fish is strong enough that fish should be accorded the same considerations as terrestrial vertebrates in regard to relief from pain. You know, that's kind of huge to have an association from a a veterinary background saying that. And so there isn't any question of whether or not fish feel pain. Yeah. But when we look at other experiences of fish, um, there's a book that I actually learned about from your podcast. I listened to one of your earlier podcasts about fish Mm. um, called What a Fish Knows by Jonathan Balcombe. Yeah, great book. And it's, it's fantastic. And I'm actually not even finished with it. And I have already learned so many things from this book. And so I, I've had a few examples that I wanted to, um, to touch on. Mm-hmm. And a huge thing with, with fish that I find really fascinating is their capacity for social interactions and relationships. We know that fish, even though they can't vocalize out of water the way we can, they still communicate underwater with each other through a huge variety of noises. They make clicks and chirps and croaks and all sorts of different low or high frequency noises to communicate with each other and express intent and different, you know, desires and interests. I have two, two little fish that came in just this week, actually, two Blackmore goldfish named Pugsley and Wednesday from, you know, from the Adams family. They're an adorable uh, um, little couple of fish. So funny because I saw them on your Facebook post and yeah. I was like, what odd names. But now that you said, I was like, oh yeah, that's where they came from. The names. That's great. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. <laughs> it's the funny. names they came with. Oh, okay. Uh, and I, I love to try to keep the names that, that animals come with. Unfortunately, they arrived in water that was not the healthiest. There was a fair bit of ammonia and nitride in in the water, Mm. and they were showing the effects of that. So I I slowly acclimated them and moved them into their new aquarium, and Pugsley immediately was just up and about and feeling fine. But poor little Wednesday had a a couple days where she clearly wasn't feeling great. And I'm happy to say that now she's feeling wonderful and, and is doing great, but she had a few days where she wasn't feeling well. She was kind of listless, sitting at the bottom of the tank a lot. And Pugsley did not leave her side for that entire period. Hmm. And it was so apparent that Pugsley recognized that Wednesday wasn't feeling well. And she would sit there next to her friend and she would gently touch her with her fins and gently bump her with her body and kind of nudge her with her face. And from my perspective, it seemed very clear that Pugsley was really trying to give her comfort and companionship while she wasn't feeling well. In the same way that if we feel sick, maybe our dog will come and sit with us and help us feel better. Yeah. Fish have that same capacity to recognize the feelings of others and, and to provide comfort and companionship and, and things like that, which I just think is amazing to, to witness. And, and I love to, to think about the social lives of, of fish. You know, we, we can document a lot of that underwater, but being able to actually witness it in my home is, is really kind of, um, it feels like a huge privilege. So Fish are often called the forgotten food animal because we pay so little attention to them, even in the animal rights community. They're rarely seen, rarely talked about. And 
you know, I think a lot of that's due to the fact that we can't interact with them as easily as with mm -hmm. land animals, like going, being able to go to a farm sanctuary and see animals. They're, they're of course, separated from us in the water. And they also look different from us because in the water, they don't really have a need for expressive faces or mouths or eyelids. And so I think people struggle to relate to fish. And, and I think it's been a similar challenge with chickens and birds. Definitely. So, yeah. So what can we do to change that so that we can bridge that gap and bring advocates and, and everyone, the public, the general public, closer to these animals? That's a, a very good question and something that that I'm trying to help with, with um, Friends of Philip, but is a huge problem for fish in general. Yeah. You know, fish are the, they're the most consumed food animal. They're the most numerous pet animal, and they're really second only to mice in their numbers used for scientific research. Wow. And despite that, as you said, they're, they're talked about so infrequently relative to the other farmed animals. And that's not to say that any of those other farmed animals aren't 100% worthy of being talked about and advocated for as well. They all need our help. And so that was a, a little bit of like that, recognizing that gap was a little bit of what um, got me interested in fish rescue and advocacy to begin with. Mm. And I think the first step to trying to change that problem with with our ability to connect to them is really acknowledging that that's a problem, that they do live in a place that we rarely see or visit or consider. You know, how many of us in our entire lives spend any significant amount of time underwater? Um, really, unless you're someone who is, is very lucky and privileged to spend a significant amount of time snorkeling or scuba diving, most of us never get to see a fish in their natural environment. Yeah. And so most of the interactions I think that kind of your average person might have with a live fish is with a fish that's kept as a pet. And unfortunately, the care recommendations that many of those fish are sold with are just woefully inadequate. Hmm. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to see a betta who is living in a half gallon bowl and see that that fish is listless and colorless and inactive and non-responsive and all these things, and then dismiss that fish as boring and apply that to fish as a broad group and say, oh, fish are boring because the only fish I've ever seen doesn't do anything. He just sits there. So something I think that we can do to help change that is looking at ways that we can really enable that connection in a way that maybe isn't identical to a farm animal sanctuary, but is, is somewhat similar. So of course, the, the main purpose of any sanctuary is to provide sanctuary and refuge for the, re the animal residents who live there and who call that place home and to give them protection and freedom from the exploitation of the system that they came from. And then a secondary purpose is, is that people can see those animals and they can see them living a happy life and they can see them exercising their natural behaviors and they can recognize the individuality of these creatures. But when we look at, at like fish that are traditionally caught or raised for food, like salmon or, or trout or tuna, looking at a fish like that and the size of that animal and the very unique, complex needs of that animal, it's incredibly challenging, at least from my, from my perspective, to think of any kind of sanctuary model that we could humanely apply to a fish like a salmon or a tuna. Mm. Um, because how do you keep a fish like that in a tank and call it? humane. I, I don't know if there's a way to do that. These are enormous fish who can swim for miles in the ocean and who deserve that freedom. But then their much smaller cousins, these uh, quote unquote pet fish species like goldfish and bettas and these other small tropical fish, they're also exploited. So I think that what we're trying to do with Friends of Philip is offer rescue and sanctuary to some of those pet fish species and allow people to connect to them in ways that like a farm animal sanctuary allows people to connect to rescued farm animals. So we try to share information about what a truly appropriate pet fish environment looks like. Um, we try to share stories of their personalities and their experiences and the fun things that they do and the way that they experience the world 
to try to enable that connection and make it easier for people to relate to aquatic life. Going back to that little fish in the bowl that's boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So, so the reason that someone would maybe perceive that that fish is boring is because they don't have a proper environment, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you go to like an animal shelter and you're interested in adopting a dog and you're walking through the rows of the animal shelter cages and you see a dog who's maybe at the fence and barking like crazy and seems very scary and intimidating. And then the next the next cage has a dog who is cowering in the back and who is scared and afraid. We all know that that's not the true personality of either of those animals. Mm. And they're responding to living in an environment of intense stress and fear and uncertainty. And for a fish in a bowl, it's almost a step further because in a bowl, it's such a small amount of water and, you know, all animal waste produces ammonia and when a fish is stuck in this small amount of water, ammonia accumulates very rapidly in the water and it burns the fish's gills, it burns his body, it, it damages his fins, it makes him much more susceptible to illness and disease. Hmm. So not only is the literal water that he's been living in toxic and contaminated, he's then also confined and the water is cold. And like when you keep a betta in a, in a bowl, but it's a tropical fish and they need water in the kind of 78 to 82 Fahrenheit range, but a bowl kept at room temperature is maybe 10 degrees colder than that fish actually needs. And so of course they're lethargic and of course they seem boring because they feel terrible. Uh -huh. They're stressed and they're, and they're probably sad and they're scared and they're just living in an environment that is completely not conducive to a, a healthy or natural life for them. Oh, that makes me so sad. <laughs> it is heartbreaking. I had no idea, you know, I mean, I knew that it would, would be terrible and just boring, just kind of not having any kind of stimulation and being in a small mm -hmm. space, but I didn't know all of those other factors. You know, we, we need to educate ourselves if we're going to bring these animals into our, into our homes. Wow. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I want you to tell us a little more about the pet fish industry. I know that mm -hmm. fish are caught in the wild to be sold. And there's also breeding facilities where they breed the fish to be sold. Yes. So how does this industry work and what are some of the problems with this industry? The the pet fish industry is, is really kind of fascinating in like a a dark way, if you will, I guess, the, the same way that any of these industries are fascinating in the way that they function. It's really multifaceted because when you're, when you're looking at aquarium fish, and I mean fish in general, um, the two kind of main categories, there's freshwater and there's saltwater. Freshwater fish that are kept in aquariums, about 90% of those fish are captive bred. And when we're looking at captive breeding of fish, it's essentially taking the concept of a fish farm that we use for the fish that people eat and applying that to these smaller fish on just kind of a smaller scale. So you still have these enormous tanks that are housed maybe thousands of fish and you get some of the same problems that we see in large scale breeding operations, like in, in CAFOs and confined animal feeding operations and things like that in the food animal industry, where you have large populations in an environment that isn't suitable to supporting those large populations for any sustained period of time. So you get more diseases, you get deformities and birth defects from improper breeding practices and things like that. Um, really, these fish live in, in situations where they aren't counted as individuals. They're frequently measured out by weight. So if a store or an area orders like a thousand neon tetras, then at the neon tetra breeding location, they'll go and scoop a big net into their neon tetra tank and they'll weigh that because they know how much a thousand neon tetras weigh. And then they'll send those fish out to the stores. And of course you get losses in shipping, you get losses in breeding, you get losses at the store. And all of these are just accepted as part of the process flow, if you will. Loss, <laughs> like I'm an engineer, yeah, so I think in that way. Uh, but. Well, losses as in they're dying, the, yes. they die in every, every step of the process. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Any, I mean, any large scale manufacturing process has loss. And um, when you're looking at manufacturing of products, product loss is inevitable and acceptable. But 
when the products that you're looking at creating are living animals, every single one of those losses is an animal's life. And that's a huge significant thing that isn't, isn't really considered in the pet fish trade and in the kind of the larger animal industry. Right. So, so that's freshwater fish of, of largely captive bred and then saltwater fish have a whole different set of issues. So the majority of the saltwater fish in the aquarium trade are wild caught and most of them are reef fish species. So you have people going into these delicate reef ecosystems and catching the wild fish and pulling them from their homes to ship them across the world to live in someone's home aquarium. And some of the practices used to catch these fish are horrifying. A common one that's that's outlawed in a lot of places but is still regularly practiced is called cyanide fishing, mm. where they will actually use cyanide to kind of stun the, the fish that they're interested in catching and then catch that fish and, and take them out of the reef. But I mean, we all know how toxic cyanide is and many of the fish die on contact. It's estimated that about 75% die within an hour of exposure to cyanide. And then 30% of those who do survive die somewhere later in the process, either before or during shipping. Um, And then that's not to mention the effects that spraying cyanide around corals has because cyanide is very dangerous for coral and, and deadly as well. So ecologically, there's a huge impact from the saltwater aquarium hobby. There's actually a documentary coming out soon that I'm really excited to see called The Dark Hobby, and it covers the effects of wild-caught aquarium fish in or on reef ecosystems in Hawaii. So that's a, a great mm-hmm. documentary to keep an eye out for if you're uh, interested in learning more about that. Yeah, we could put a link to that film in the show notes, The Dark Hobby. And I'm, I, huh, okay. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's just so fascinating. And yeah, like you said, fascinating, but in a really horrible way. So they're catching these tropical fish mm-hmm. out of the wild with cyanide. I just, I, oh. and I, I've heard too that this is decimating some of the populations, uh, endangering yes. the species, actually, right? Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. There are a number of common aquarium species who are now um, vulnerable or endangered in the wild. An example of that, it's a freshwater fish, but the Malabar or pea puffer is a little fish native to Southern India. And kind of unfortunately for the pea puffer, they're absolutely adorable. And so they're incredibly popular in the aquarium hobby. And they're also fairly hard to breed in captivity. So Pea puffers are now listed as vulnerable in the wild due to habitat loss from farming and agricultural runoff, and then also capture for the aquarium trade. So the ecological impact that buying and keeping aquatic fish has is is very substantial and something that I, I think needs to be thought about and talked about. Because if you go to like your local Petco and you want to buy a clownfish, it's almost guaranteed that that clownfish was pulled out of a wild reef somewhere. And it's kind of a weird, <laughs> ironic twist that, you know, with the, with the movie Finding Nemo by Pixar, the demand for clownfish really skyrocketed mm. with that movie, which is, is sad and funny in a, in a kind of dark way again, I guess, yeah. because and, um, and ironic of course because that movie was about, I, I, yeah, it's, it's about Nemo being say. pulled from his family. Right, right. It's just totally ironic because if you watch the film, it's it's very pro fish. Yeah, yeah. It's like how terrible to pull a baby fish from his family and put him into your aquarium. And then the irony, of course, is that that made a lot of people want to do that exact thing. Uh, and so there, there's you know, there's not much transparency there of where these fish come from and and what the effects are and things, which is a huge problem. Just tragic. Yeah. Yeah. So Gwendolyn, can you share a story with us about a particular fish that you've rescued that maybe, you know, touched you in some way, uh, a, a, maybe an interesting story? I know you told us about Philip mm-hmm. and also Pugsley and Wednesday. We know them now too, <laughs> <laughs> but I'd, I'd love to hear more. Tell us more. Tell us another fish story. I've been thinking about this a lot and it's such a hard decision to make, to pick kind of a single story, of course, because there are so many unique ones here um, in my my little group of us. 
I have over 80 fish. I have to kind of routinely update my, my records and my tracking, depending on how many have come in. And I periodically adopt fish out and things, but we do have a, a fairly significant population, which is funny to look at in, in terms of like speaking about sanctuaries, because of course a farm animal sanctuary, having 80 animals is a lot. And yeah, but fish are tiny and fish are tiny. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, and that's the cool thing is that yeah. I have 23 aquariums and ponds which is a lot of aquariums and ponds, of course. Many of those hold a single fish, which is my, my bettas. And then others have, have little community fish in them and, and communities that thrive together and everything like that. So hmm. there's a huge variety of fish and a huge variety in the backstories of these fish. Hmm. So one who, who sticks out a lot and who will always have a special place to me is, is my um, King Betta Isaac. King bettas are, they're just a slightly larger type of betta where a, a regular betta is maybe two and a half inches long. A king betta might be three to three and a half. And Isaac was a store rescue and he was sold in one of those little cups on the shelf at um, a large chain pet store. The funny thing with trying to do store rescue is that the store isn't going to let you take home a healthy fish because there is still the potential for that fish to be sold. The only way that you can really rescue a fish without paying for them is if they're in poor enough health that the store feels like they're not going to survive, which is just like horrible, right? To have that, have to have that kind of thought process. And Isaac is a fish who I saw at the pet store for about a month. And I saw him there every time I was there and he was never sold because He's kind of a plain looking fish. And so many people, when they buy a betta in particular, they want a bright, vibrant, colorful fish. And Isaac is kind of like a tan, clear sort of color. He doesn't have vibrant, wonderful coloring. So he looks very plain. And he was sitting on this shelf. And every time I was there buying fish food or buying air pumps or buying any of these things I need, I just watched him decline and slowly just clearly show the effects of having lived in this cup for so long. Mm -hmm. He was sitting like curved on the bottom of his cup. And um, that's a very common thing that when they're kept in extreme confinement like that, of course, their muscles begin to like waste away and they lose their strength. Finally, I was allowed to take Isaac home as an adoption. And for the first couple of weeks that I had him, Isaac couldn't swim to the top of more than three or four inches of water. Bettas actually are a type of fish. They have an organ called a labyrinth organ that they use to breathe air from the surface. Hmm. And so they need to be able to reach the top of the water so that they can breathe air. So Isaac for so long had this problem that he couldn't reach the top of the water. And I was worried that he was going to live his life severely impaired from the effects of, of having lived in such a confined space. Hmm. So we set up a, a special aquarium for Isaac. It's a 12 gallon long. It's like three feet long and only about nine or 10 inches tall. So I was able to keep the water fairly shallow. So if he had these effects for his whole life, he could still have as full of a life as possible. And the cool thing with Isaac is that with a few weeks of just a change of environment and clean water and warm water and high quality food and consistent care, he completely recovered. Now, every time I walk past his tank, he swims the full length with no problems. And he's always there and dancing at me and ready for his food and just Aww. like ready to say hi. I think he's such a wonderful example of the real resiliency that these little animals have and their ability to kind of recover and move past the things that we put them through. So sweet. I love it. And you, you said that, that he, I heard you say this about another fish too. You said Isaac danced for you. What do you mean when you say they dance? <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't really know how else to describe it because all of them, it's so sweet to see because when they show up, they have no idea about people or where food comes from or any of those things, but it takes the fish roughly three meals, maybe four meals to learn that a person coming up to the tank means that they're likely to be fed. Ah. <laughs> and of course, you know, every animal is happy to be fed and bettas in particular love, love, love to eat. And so they learn so quickly that when you come up to the tank, that it might be time for dinner. And so they sit at the edge of the tank and they do this little adorable back and forth kind of wiggle 
that I just always think of as the dinner dance. <laughs> and it's just incredibly charming and it's so it. sweet to see. And it's always my favorite thing when a new fish comes in and I see them learn the dinner dance because they definitely don't know it when they get here. And it's just so cute and, and wonderful to see them um, get excited about their, their dinner coming. That's great. I love it. The dinner dance. <laughs> yeah. So we know as advocates that we shouldn't ever buy a fish or support mm -hmm. the industry in any way, but what if someone wanted to adopt either from you or in their area? What, what would mm -hmm. someone be getting into if they wanted to adopt or, or rescue a fish? What do they need? What resources are out there? How, do, how would they get started? How, how, how would that work? Yeah. So a, adoption and rescue are definitely great options. Um, and, and like you said, we would never advocate or encourage anybody to buy an animal. That's just not, um, something that is, is going to be a good idea for the, the animals in general. So if, if someone is interested in adopting or rescuing a fish, um, I kind of give the, the general advice that someone should follow any time they want to bring any animal into their home, which is that they really need to research the specific needs of that animal. So of course, fish are no different. They have their specific needs in terms of tank size and water temperature and all these different things. And really making sure that you respect and acknowledge those needs is huge um, because in the aquarium hobby, especially the needs and interests of the individual fish are so frequently ignored and they're ignored in favor of the interests of the aquarium keeper and having a, a pretty aquarium. And so looking past that and wanting to adopt an individual to give them a good life is incredibly important. So coming from that perspective, things to know about like keeping an aquarium is that if you're looking at a single aquarium, time-wise in terms of the amount of maintenance that you're looking at, it's not a huge time commitment, but it is a significant long-term commitment. So to maintain an aquarium, you need to do, I, I prefer to do a partial water change on all of my tanks at least once a week. And you know, we talked earlier about keeping a fish in a bowl and the effects of water quality. And a huge thing to keep in mind with fish is that water quality is everything. A single drop of 100% like pure ammonia in a 10 gallon tank comes to one part per million ammonia in that tank. And that is incredibly toxic and dangerous to fish. Mm -hmm. So having an aquarium that is poorly maintained or isn't well-established or something like that can, can be deadly to the fish that live in that tank. And so for us as fish keepers, it's of course our responsibility to be prepared to maintain that aquarium and, and keep the water healthy for the fish for their whole life, because that is their life. And that's what they breathe and what they live in and allowing the water in our aquariums to get dirty or, or become like poor water quality is incredibly harmful to those individuals. And then of course, the specific needs of the species that they're interested in. So if you want a betta, the absolute smallest tank that I would ever start with is a five gallon tank. Conversely, if you want a goldfish, if you want a common goldfish, the absolute smallest tank that I would ever start with is 75 gallons. And really that it would Wait, probably eventually that 75 gallons, 75. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. A, uh, a common goldfish can get up to 12 inches long. Oh yeah. And, um, they are prolific waste producers, which of course, then you think of how common it is that goldfish are sold to live in a bowl and that just yeah. makes it that much more terrible. Right. Right. That's what I was thinking. I was like, well, I thought that goldfish can, would be able to live in small spaces because they're, that's commonly what you think, but that's yeah. not the case, huh? Wow. It's, it's really remarkable that the goldfish in a bowl idea is so widespread because no animal, no fish is suited to live in a bowl or will ever thrive in a bowl. Yeah. But of all the species, goldfish are, are probably the worst and really any wow. fish that can survive in a bowl. It's just a testament to the, the toughness and the, the, you know, survivability of the fish. It's not a testament to the appropriate nature of that environment. Mm. And their desire to live as all animals. Yes. Desire. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Wow. And, and so if someone's in the Bay area, they could possibly adopt from you. Yes. Get, 
possibly a fish from you. And I know that that's kind of happening across the country and, and possibly in other countries too, that these fish mm -hmm. rescues are kind of popping up. Is there a resource or something if somebody is wanting to adopt and wanting to possibly adopt from a rescue or get some support, at least in their area from a rescue, what are some of the resources out there? Unfortunately, there really aren't tons of organized resources that like, you know, a list of fish rescues or things like that. Yeah, it's very new. Yes. It's, yeah. it's so new and it's yeah. amazing to see these rescues pop up and Facebook is a good resource to find rescues, um, in your area there. I think betta rescues are the most common just because bettas are one of the most abused species of pet fish and their, their relative care and space needs are somewhat minimal compared to like goldfish and other fish like that. There's also then a couple Facebook groups directed at kind of betta and general fish rescue. And those are, are great places to look. Sometimes you'll find owners who are independently rehoming their fish, or you'll find rescues on there who um, are kind of listing their fish available for adoption. Yeah. I think there's a, a group called vegans with fishes as well. There is. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. For more connection and resources. Yeah. Yeah. That's a wonderful group. So I know that some people will release domestic fish into like lakes or oceans or some body of water thinking that they're helping them, that they're, they're freeing them. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this a good thing to do? Absolutely not. Um, okay. I, I, I wish that I could say that it, it were because I do understand the desire to free an animal. Yeah. And the reality is that it's, it's just not a good idea. Um, and there's a few different reasons. So the first of course, is that when you're looking at the individual that you're releasing, they're almost certainly not native to the area that you live. If I release any of my fish, none of them are native to my area, and most of them would die as a result. Most of the fish that people keep in aquariums are tropical fish, and most areas are not tropical areas that have like suitable water temperatures and things like that to allow those fish to survive. So it's incredibly likely that the fish will suffer and die shortly after release. Mm. The next is a much larger ecological problem, which is the risk of introducing invasive species. There is a, um, a UC Davis Bodega Marine Laboratory released a report and they said that globally, the aquarium trade has contributed to, a th or has contributed a third of the world's worst aquatic and invasive species. Wow. And that's just from people maybe deciding that they don't want to fish anymore or deciding that they want to free their fish or they want to free a fish from a market or some of these things. And actually that same report quoted a survey of fish keepers in Texas found that 20 to 69% admitted to dumping aquarium fish, which of course 29, 20 to 69 is kind of a large window, but it's, it's a substantial number of people who might be interested in doing this with, uh, with invasive species. I have a few examples of some of the more destructive invasive aquatic, aquatic species. One that I think maybe many people have heard about is the lionfish. It's a saltwater fish, quite venomous and aggressive fish native to the Indo-Pacific Ocean. They have all those beautiful spines coming out. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're beautiful fish. And unfortunately, they're now incredibly common along the eastern seaboard of the United States, where they are absolutely not native. And they've actually been found as far north as Rhode Island, which is kind of crazy. There was one study that found that lionfish can reduce the native fish populations by almost 80% in just five weeks. Mm. So those fish are incredibly destructive, actually to the point that many like ecological groups and governments will um, sponsor and support hunts of these fish to have divers go out and kill as many of them as they can find in efforts to protect and preserve the native ecosystems. Um, so that's, of course, a very extreme example of an invasive species that can really have a lot of damage and impact both to the, the native ecosystem and then 
of course, to those individuals themselves that are now being hunted and killed. Yeah. And because of us. And yes. Yeah. And, and I'll just give a little caveat with the, the, the term invasive species. It kind of bothers me because, you know, I mean, who's the truly invasive species? It's humans. It's, <laughs> That's it's, a very good point. Yeah. It's because we're the ones that have invaded everywhere and, mm-hmm. and we're manipulating and changing and moving and taking these animals from their homes and putting them in stores and and I certainly don't, I know you feel this way too. Of course. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but it, you know, it's, it's that invasive species term. I just, it, it bothers me so much because it's not these animals fault in any kind yes, of way absolutely. that they ended up in the wrong place. It's humans fault. So yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. It puts a lot of strange blame onto the animals Yeah, and probably a more appropriate name would be something like human introduced non-native species Yeah, um, because that's really what they are. Right. Right. Absolutely. So Gwendolyn, I, I asked this of all my guests and I want to ask you, what gives you hope for the future? That's such a good question. And I feel like in in animal advocacy and rescue, it can be very easy to feel hopeless because you see some of these horrible, horrible situations that these animals come from. For me, I think a a huge source of hope is in the people who work so hard to change those situations and to save those animals. So I don't, do I have time for a quick uh, fish rescue story? Please, we would okay. love <laughs> um, So one of my first, I don't know, I feel like it was one of my first like intense, if you will, rescue experiences was last August. My, my partner and I are big rock climbers and um, we periodically drive to places like Tahoe to kind of disappear for the weekend, go into the woods and do some rock climbing. Mm. And I have this habit of every time we're driving through a major area, I kind of peruse the Craigslist listings leading up to when we drive through there just to see if there are any fish that are in need in that area or other aquatic animals who maybe just by me being through there, I might be able to pick them up and and bring them and give them safety. Hmm. So last August, we were going through a really intense heat wave. Um, Temperatures were in the upper 90s here in Santa Rosa and Sacramento was forecast to hit like 112 degrees. I um, remember <laughs> on the weekend, it was crazy. Yeah. And the Tuesday leading up to our, our trip, we were going to go on an extended weekend. The Tuesday leading up, I found this listing on Craigslist that said something to the effect of group of goldfish in tank outside, like waiting, like ready for whoever wants them. Mm-hmm. It was a, a group of nine or 10 goldfish and a few other fish in this glass aquarium outside. I was like, oh my gosh, no fish can survive, no animal or even like a plant could survive in a glass aquarium outside in 112 degree heat. And so I messaged the person and I said, Hey, we'll be coming through that area next week. Will you take the fish inside? And I will pick them all up on Tuesday. And the person responded and said, they're outside because I don't have space. Whatever dies goes in the trash, LOL. (gasps) And I was just like, Oh my gosh. Like I was completely floored that that was the response. I'm sitting there. It's like Tuesday evening. I'm like, should I drive to Sacramento right now and just pick up these fish? And that was going to be the backup plan. But then I I posted on Reddit, which is that community forum. And they have a, a number of wonderful aquarium subreddits. They're called communities. And I posted and said, group of goldfish in desperate need in Sacramento. If there's someone who's able to go and save these fish and keep them inside so they don't die this weekend, I can pick them up on Tuesday. And within five minutes of posting, I had five or six responses and there were two or three people in the area who were like, I, I can help them. I can help. And and a lady reached out and she said, I will go pick them up this evening. So I sent her the advertisement and within 15 minutes of making this post, she was in her car and off to pick up these fish. Wow. And she picked them up and she brought them home and she kept them in her house through the weekend. And then I picked them up on Tuesday and brought them home and they're now outside in a 300 gallon pond with plants and nice cool water and no risk of overheating in an aquarium. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really experiences like that, where you have this one person who is showing such cruelty, but then for every one of those people, there's so many people who are ready and willing to jump in and help. That's something I've just continuously encountered in the animal rescue world and in the vegan community in general. And that's the kind of thing that, that really gives me a lot of hope that we are going to, going to change things. And it might take a while, but the change is happening. 
Well, Gwendolyn, it's really been wonderful to have you. I feel like I've learned so much from you uh, just in this time we've had together. I'm so proud. Yeah. And I, I thank you so much for your wonderful work. What an exciting new development and new area fish rescue and you're on the cutting edge of a really new and exciting part of advocacy work. So uh, thank you for all that you do. And thank you for talking to us today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast. You can find Friends of Philip Fish Rescue on Facebook and Instagram, and I really recommend following them. Gwendolyn posts the stories of her fish friends, and it's it's just so beautiful to watch and to see the transformations from when they come to her and how vibrant and healthy they become in her care. Please support her in any way you can, and if you found this episode informative and important, please share it on your social media pages or maybe send it to friends in an email. We appreciate you spreading the love, spreading the information, and thank you so much for caring about fishes and all animals. And please, live vegan.